Now, the one-size-fits-all approach in regulation has been there for uh, many years. And I think uh, the key point of it is to have one indicator for all types of banks, which we'll have to comply with, uh, irrespective to the business models and irrespective to the ownership structure, be it savings banks or cooperative banks or other type of banks. This has been uh, pushed in Europe and in f I think this also gives the opportunity for many banks to be regulated the same way. So this is the one-size-fits-all approach. Now, in terms of other countries in the world, this might not be the case because many cooperative banks, for example, let's say in Latin America or if, if they exist in different forms, let's say in the United States, they are not necessarily regulated the same way means that they are in different types of regulation, like for example, the US uh, uh, credit unions, they are, uh, they are uh, uh, regulated with different types of regulation. So in reality, uh, the uh, one size fits all approach can be much more relevant in some regions uh, than it's not very relevant in other regions. Well, the current approach to regulation seems to be featuring a kind of uh, approach which is called one size fits all, which means that they do not diversify, they do not differentiate much uh, across different types of banks. That is uh, a problem in my view because uh, of two uh, main reasons. The first reason is that the one size fits all introduces, uh, gives a lot of weight, perhaps the single most important variable is capital. Now in um, a cooperative banks for instance you have that some types of cooperative banks may find it hard to um, get capital quickly on the market and um, yet it is important to recognize that over time they will be able to do it. The second main problem with one size fits all regulation is that the cost of regulatory compliance tends to be the same across banking groups and if you are a small bank you will be charged proportionally more. So although regulators talk about proportionality, I don't think they do it in practice. The interesting part in terms of supervision and regulation is that uh, cooperative banks and savings banks are typically organized as parts of networks of affiliated institutions. And this kind of network structure is something which creates a lot of difficulties and misunderstanding on the side of regulators and supervisors. So what they should really do uh, in order to be able to do justice to these types of institutions and their specific strengths is uh, to understand what these network structures are, that they are not basically anti-competitive, but that they are something which is needed to make these small and decentralized organizations competitive with large branch banks. Now, uh, cooperative banks, we have assessed them in Europe. And clearly, in the financial crisis, they have fared better if they follow the retail uh, diversified business model. Now, if they, f uh, they follow the wholesale business model, whereby they get their funding from the market, so they can be subject to some liquidity risks, then they might not uh, fare better than others. Now, the ones that we have looked at, and I think uh, they have pretty much um, managed to keep their um, performance level uh, above average and also the risk level uh, more or less below average. These are the ones, uh, the banks, I mean, that they have followed the uh, business model, which is retail diversified. The great crisis that started in 2007, 2009, and it reached the apex of instability with the failure 
of Lehman Brothers Company uh, in September 2008 was a big crisis, the greatest financial crisis since the 1930s, and it was also the most important crisis because it did not come from a remote place, but it came from the center of the financial world, from Wall Street. And uh, when the crisis comes from the center of the financial markets, uh, the consequences in terms of dissipating trust on uh, financial institutions, financial intermediaries, the financial markets at large, that damage is much greater. So uh, the, um, the, the single item I would cite about the cooperative banks and why they did fare better during the crisis is that they were able to nurture and retain the trust of many, many families, customers at large in society, so that while um, the big bankers were frequently labeled banksters, the cooperative banks, on the other hand, were able to show to the people, to the people in the street, that there is another way of doing banking, more responsible and uh, not exploitative. The question is inter interesting. I don't know whether the situation is the same in every country, but in Germany it is quite clear that the cooperative banks, as a group, fared much better than all other banking groups um, for various reasons. One is, of course, that be being small and decentralized, they never had the idea of being heavily involved in investing in toxic assets. That is, they avoided the greatest danger. And secondly, they have a strong loyalty of their client base, and this client base had to rely on these banks during the crisis, that is, why uh, cooperative banks and savings banks expanded lending operations while others, while the private banks, contracted lending substantially. Now, the past years we've been developing a new research on uh, business uh, models in European banking trying to understand what exactly banks do based on the inputs and outputs that they have in general. So the business model, uh, I would say the concept, allows us to match activity indicators with funding indicators and understand what banks do if they uh, behave over time in the system. So uh, clearly uh, the business model uh, concept has been applied on the banking sector in Europe for the moment. Uh, and then we have uh, extended this approach to the US banking sector and also to Latin American uh, banking sectors. Uh, the idea is to understand what are the business models for the banks uh, that are operating within national systems, but also to understand what is their contribution to systemic stability and economic growth. And uh, hereby, we would like also to see uh, to what extent they are robust and resilient. When I say robust, it means that how would they behave in terms, of, uh, in terms of external shocks if there are major financial crises like the one we had in 2007 and 8, but also to what extent they can adapt themselves post-financial crisis or post-other crises which is very important for the regulators and also for the policymakers in general to allow them to have different indicators to assess the accumulation of risk in the system over time. The uh, Great Crisis was a crisis uh, that started in 2007 and it was very acute over 2008-2009. Now that crisis was a crisis that came from financial markets, from investment banks. And 
um, the extent to which the entire banking system was involved depended on various, uh, uh, various components. One of the components was that the other banks had invested in the so-called structured finance products. And yet, it was important to recognize that traditional banking, those banks that had kept doing traditional banking, were less responsible for uh, leading to the crisis. So the diversity of bank types, the diversity of bank business models, proved to be very important to recognize uh, who had contributed more to build up the systemic risk that led to the explosion of the crisis, and who had contributed less. Again, the cooperative banks, and to some extent also the savings banks, had contributed less than the commercial banks. And within the commercial banks, we can further distinguish between retail-oriented or uh, other types of banks. But cooperative banks were certainly less responsible for the crisis. In terms of global financial sector stability, it is very important that we do not only have one type, one organizational form of banking. If we have various types, that is normal commercial banking, investment banking, uh, then uh, the danger is there that they all behave in the same way. Uh, having banks that follow a different business model uh, could uh, mitigate the shocks and create diversity and thus that's a kind of risk diversification and that's why it is beneficial. And secondly, the average riskiness of uh, financial institutions is lower if the banking system is composed not only of big banks but also of these small banks and their networks. 